Solomon Islands. This sounds so majestic and so remote. Trying to get to the Solomon Islands is kind of mission impossible. It's not very tourist. Going back and seeing a lot of the interesting World War II sites as this was a historical moment and scuba diving. Make sure you take lots of mosquito repellent. <laughs> lots of it. Because Solomon Islands, going there is like a blast from the past. You need to see a lot of the tribal cultures on the many thousands of islands and going back and seeing a lot of the interesting World War II sites as this was a historical moment in World War II, the Pacific Theater, that I'll talk about more later. And what I'd like to say is the pristine coral that should be there, but things are changing and I'll get into that shortly as well. Let's dive on in the Solomon Islands. Let's first talk about the best time to visit Solomon Islands. And that's an easy one because there is no wrong time to visit. It's worth noting that the monsoon season is between January and March. And that doesn't necessarily mean anything bad. It just means it's going to rain more and that might create its own scenic beauty. But it's not necessarily attracting any animals or changing anything that you would see scuba diving. The water stays fairly warm at 27 to 31 degrees Celsius, which is quite warm year round. And it's fairly sheltered being that the islands kind of form a nice cove often when you go there you'll be aboard a live aboard which will take you between the islands and for the most part I never experienced rough seas while there and as far as I know there's no real dive resorts in the area so I believe the only way to really see and experience things is either by a day boat from the main island Guadalcanal inside the main city Hoinera or by Liveaboard which there's only a handful there. One interesting aspect of the Solomon Islands is it's not very tourist. They are not really after the tourist market and they haven't really built an infrastructure for it. So when you go there, you'll see two odds of a lot of the population being on the main island, Guadalcanal. It's very industrious in the way that they are doing a lot of fishing and logging and a lot of construction and trying to build their industry because I believe Solomon Islands is really going after trying to export more. And tourism isn't a really on the roadmap as far as I've seen, for better or worse. But that doesn't mean you can't go there and enjoy yourself. Just expect not to be catered too much or be blown away by the amenities offered. With that said, it is still great and I believe everywhere in this world is worth exploring. Solomon Islands is still worth being on your roadmap and scuba diving, which is still pretty good scuba diving. Going there, I would say my bar for what I would see was very high because I believe that this was fairly in touch and a remote part of the world for the amount of population there. And honestly, I was a little disappointed for how my expectations were, but that doesn't mean that there's still not great scuba dive. One thing worth mentioning, getting there, I believe when we boarded our live aboard, we were a group of maybe 10 or 12 people and a good three or four individuals on our boat. And that's almost a quarter that lost their luggage. <laughs> so going back to the infrastructure and Solomon Islands isn't really catering to tourists. Trying to get to the Solomon Islands is kind of mission impossible. I gotta tell this story. When we were trying to go, we had booked our tickets through Fiji Air and partnership with Solomon Airlines. What's very fascinating is the tickets we booked were just randomly canceled in such a way that we weren't automatically even refunded. I guess when you book your tickets going to Solomon Airlines, it's at your own risk of potentially not getting your money back. However, if you complain about it and find the right people, which will take a number of phone calls, you can still get refunded. But when you have a ticket going there, it means nothing. It just means that maybe you have an intent for a plan, but that plan may not align very well with the things that are going on there because you'll just have your tickets randomly canceled. We would call the Solomon Airlines company and they would say that their airfield was being repaired that day or it, it, there's all sorts of interesting things that I'm not sure what is right and everyone on our boat experienced very similar things. So trying to get there kind of takes a little bit of a roll of the die. Everyone on our boat made it, so that's great. I think everyone eventually got their luggage to some degree at different stages of the trip, but there's just all this chaos of just getting there. Let's talk about trying to prepare for what happens if you do lose your luggage. Make sure you at least keep the primary things you want to have for your diving 
on in a carry-on baggage that you have with you at all times. That's probably several pairs of clothes or clothes that you're gonna dive in. It is warm water, so you don't need that much and any essential scuba gear. If your luggage is lost, you could still go with rentals. Of course, that may be detrimental to your experience. It's not your gear. Of course, you're going back to a, probably a jacket style BCD which no one was super fond of, but it works and you can still enjoy your time. Fortunately, we didn't lose our luggage and we we're still able to have access to everything we brought. This is kind of funny, the logistics of getting to Solomon Islands is probably the hardest part of going to Solomon Islands. But once you're there, everything's good. All right, let's talk about the history of Solomon Islands. I'm a big history buff and I really enjoy learning about the culture and the history. I know you may not be, so I'm gonna keep it brief. But what's interesting about the Solomon Islands is the main island, Guadalcanal, was the site of a major World War II battle where the American fleet, the Pacific fleet, met the Japanese fleet. And I'm not going to get into any of the logistics of like, there's a whole bunch of thoughts that this battle was completely unnecessary. And I'm just going to say that this is where the American and the Japanese fleet met for the first time and battled over the Guadalcanal and the way it went down was very interesting to me and seeing a lot of the World War II sites and the leftover equipment was really cool to experience. The Americans landed on the beach of Guadalcanal overnight and it was very quiet and a very successful landing. They were able to take an airfield that the Japanese were building on the island that put a lot of the region at threat of the expansion of the Japanese military at the time. The Americans were able to take it, but then the Japanese fleet came and battered the American fleet and they had to leave. The Americans were surrounded on the island, but the Americans were able to take the airfield and start fortifying the area. So they just needed to hopefully figure out how to survive while they were surrounded by the enemy until the American fleet could come back. The Americans were able to hold the airfield. The battle ended with the Japanese making one last ditch effort by sending several ships that were kind of makeshift to try and land a whole bunch of troops on the island. But the Americans were able to have a whole bunch of cannons set up and they blew apart the ships before they could land. Anyways, right off of Point Air now is the leftover remains of the submarine, the three ships. And even though those ships didn't really make it and the Japanese couldn't retake the island, the remains there are some of the greatest World War II that I've seen. And they are just fantastic and well-preserved right in the harbor area. It's worth noting that if you do plan to go here, make sure, and maybe this is a reason not to go during monsoon season, if it's freshly rained, the visibility will be very poor because one of the major rivers on Guadalcanal dumps out and when it rains, the rain will hit the island and take a bunch of dirt into the river and that will just flood the entire dive site with a bunch of fresh silt and it just won't <laughs> we tried diving there after a fresh rain and i feel if you extended your hand in front of your face you can't see we still dove i just it just wasn't very pleasant so take that in mind and i'm gonna go ahead and take a moment and talk about hoinera and guadalcanal itself so there is one thing while there i wanted to do and visit a world war ii site and i will say that it was quite challenging it's almost like two hours from where you'll stay in hoinera and it's in the middle of a jungle, which is pretty cool. Make sure you take lots of mosquito repellent. <laughs> lots of it, because I ended up getting malaria there. I, I went there, my wife and I and a couple of friends were there to see this outside museum. Make sure it's not raining. <laughs> or maybe if it's raining, the mosquitoes will be gone. Uh, some pros and cons. On the scale of things, the museum isn't on top of the list of things I've seen, but it was still cool for me. And since we invested so much time there, I was not gonna stop at nothing until I saw everything there. <laughs> this is the way I am. And the mosquitoes were just battering us. So my wife did a full retreat back to the van. She couldn't take the mosquitoes. And I was like, I'm here, I'm going to YOLO and experience this thing. And unfortunately, I just got a bunch of bites and I got malaria from this incident. I know it, they, there is malaria risk there. And fortunately, it was at the end of our trip. Two weeks later, I came down with, there's four different strains of malaria and I got the most deadly one. Almost was fatal, but 
Like I was able to get it diagnosed and here I am today still. Malaria is no joke. I would not wish it on my worst enemies. And that's one of the things I remember from this trip the most. So don't get malaria. <coughs> All right, let's talk about the submarine and those transport ships from the end of the Guadalcanal battle because they are fantastic dive sites. And if you are just to go to Guadalcanal, I would say check out these dive sites because they're fairly worthwhile. The submarine is really cool because there's sections that you can go through the submarine and it's kind of, it's upheld fairly well just along the ground. It's at an angle, so it goes fairly deep, but you can dive the whole thing without with recreational diving and the reef is fairly healthy around it there's lots of fish to see or just living in and around the submarine it is quite a spectacular dive site and it's called the japanese i-1 submarine and the three transport ships are the bonega one two and three three is not diveable because uh, that's i think the one that actually made it to shore the other two were destroyed before they made it to shore. They're now great dive sites. They go pretty deep and I think to see the whole ship you have to be a tech diver but you can still see most of them as a recreational diver and they're still beautiful dive sites and you can just, I don't know, you can spend quite a number of dives there with the impressive diversity of the marine life, the fish, the coral, and the ships. It is quite nice. These ships, I don't recall you can really penetrate in them too much. They're fairly intact. And it's also worth mentioning, there's several bombers littered around the Guadalcanal and you can go see them and dive to them recreationally. And they're also pretty amazing to see with the amount of coral. They're deep, so it's not super full of color. And it'll be fairly blue when you get down to them. You'll have to watch your no deco time, but they are quite cool to be able to see and go down, spend some time with the bomber, and then start shallowing up as a dive. Just looked it up. I apologize, but Nega 3 is actually a dive site and it didn't make it to the shore. It is deep at 50 meters, so obviously you need to be a tech diver to get down to that thing and it's not for recreational diving. That's why we didn't go. Alright, let's talk about the liveaboard experience. One unique aspect is you'll jump around several different island chains being usually the Russell Island Group, Florida Islands, Morovo Lagoon, and Mary Island. And somewhere up north there, you'll also have a very unique dive experience. I forget what the dive site's called. I couldn't find it in my dive log, but you'll be diving near an underwater volcano that is active and it hopefully it still is when you go there, but the pressure changes and the vibration of that volcano is quite extraordinary. I've never experienced something so powerful in terms of just the sound and movement. I will say that if you're a person that has a heart condition of any kind, you should avoid this dive because I feel that if you don't have a normal cadence of heart, it could actually, it, the amount of pressure changes that you experience on this dive could affect your heart. I don't know, I felt like my heart was stopping with the rupturing of this volcano. You don't see the volcano, it's too far and probably would die from the vibrations from the volcano if it was too close. But it was really cool to experience. The most memorable, and I would highly recommend if you go, ask for as many days in the Florida island chain as you can because that was probably the highlights of my experience. And the reef is the most pristine there I've seen anywhere else. In fact, from what I saw, a lot of the dive sites around Honera and also Russell and Morovo are slowly decaying. What's very fascinating is I've learned from other places, algae growing on coral is normal, but normally a healthy ecosystem will bring other fish and other things that eat the algae and balances out. But in this case, the algae is growing and killing all the coral. It's not bleaching that's the problem here, it is the coral decaying from over algae blooms. It kind of looks really eerie when you see it, all the fish are leaving and it looks like just death and decay in some of the corals. Did a little bit of research and I found a lot of it is because fishing has become one of the most prominent exports of the region and they've sold rights for fishing for other countries to come there and also lots of fishing internal to the country. It's a major export. The unfortunate thing is when you hunt and harvest so much that you're also killing the young fish that are born 
you're going to severely disrupt the life cycles of a lot of the fish. And you can see that in clear visibility in the Solomon Islands. I've never seen such a interesting absence of fish. You would see corals and it seems like it should be full of life. But yet I only saw death and decay in some regions. Now it gets better the deeper you go. So around 30 to 40 meters, you start seeing the life open up, but at the but sometimes 20 meter and up would be that death and decay in some regions. Not all, there were still some great dives at the more shallow levels, but it's something I've never experienced before. And I saw a lot in Solomon Islands and just looking at the sales of the export fish, you can see that it kind of spiked out and now it's starting to peter out. And you have to realize that it's because the overfishing killed off so much fish. Now they don't have as much fish left. I do hope to see that reef and that region heal up over time. Let's talk about some of the famous dive sites that you'll experience in the Solomon Islands. Starting with the cathedral, which I remember is a northern area and it's on an island that you'll have a lot of open diving, which is basically you can grab a tank and go wherever you want. You can experience the cathedral and go and explore different caverns across this different island. What's really cool is it's a lagoon with coral that reached the top of the surface and over time, parts of it have collapsed, creating caves and caverns, and you can go and explore those at your own free will with, without too much danger because they don't go too deep. You'll find in a lot of those caverns, there are things like shark nurseries and other interesting life that lives in those areas or gives birth into those areas because of the natural protection that the caves bring. And seeing the cathedral itself with light shimmering through in the early morning is quite a beauty as well. And let's also talk about White Beach is a famous area because <coughs> And you'll hear the whole story. After the Guadalcanal campaign was over, the Americans didn't want to take all their equipment out of there. So they were going to sell it to the Guadalcanal government, or sorry, the Solomon Island government. And apparently they couldn't reach an agreement on the sale price. So they just went and just literally tossed it into the river and this dive site that they now call White Beach. It kind of seems like such a waste of all this equipment and it could have helped the Solomon Islands quite a bit, but now it's a great dive site, so pros and cons. And it can go pretty deep, this dive site, but what's really cool is along the whole shelf of the river down to the bottom of the river, you will find just a whole bunch of World War II memorabilia from tractors, jeeps, and more, and trucks. And it's just really cool to see. I have to say, when you go there, make sure you leave everything as you found it. It is now part of history and something that we shouldn't affect. And you can tell not too many people have been to this dive site because I feel if it was more popular, it probably be picked clean by now. And this dive site could have decent current and low visibility as well. So you have to kind of get lucky with it. But it's very likely that you'll get a chance to dive at this site twice or more. And what's really cool, I remember, is by the end of the dive site, you can shallow up and in the dive site around the mangroves and see the archer fish take water in their mouth and they spit it and they shoot it, bugs out of the air, which is really cool. I didn't get good footage of it, but I did see the archer fish and it's just so cool seeing them just eyeball the bugs outside the water and trying to shoot them out of the sky. One of the reasons we went to the Solomon Islands is because we got a really good deal on the liveaboard. So if you do go, make sure you shop around, buy in advance, plan it out and look for an epically good deal because they can run really awesome and low cuts on the regular price for Solomon Islands. When we got it for the price we did, it's hard to refuse. And that's what brought us to Solomon Islands. One unique thing, diving at Solomon Islands, live aboard, that I've never had anywhere else is the way you get back on the boat. So usually you'll have your bigger vessel, your live aboard that goes near the reef. But of course it can't go too close to the reef. It damaged the vessel or damaged the reef. But generally you go on a little dinghy to the reef and you'll dive back entry into the water near the reef, your dive site. But after the dive, what they do is they throw out this long line and you will grab a hold of the line and it'll pull you like a tugboat back to the boat. And it's a really interesting experience. Of course, if you go, I highly recommend a stingy suit or a stingy shirt, just for a rash guard, something to make sure that you're not gonna get stung to hell by jellyfish because there's lots of jellyfish at the surface 
absorbing the sunlight and it'll just pull you right through, which is kind of cool if you don't have to worry about them stinging you and maybe block your face or something. But it's just kind of when you get pulled through and you're going fairly fast and on this rope, it kind of feels like you're at warp speed and all these like jellyfish are flying around. It's just a cool experience. You have to check it out and let me know what you think. In terms of fish, you will see a good variety and a really good strong variety of medium size fish. In some areas like the Jackson Reef, you can actually see the pygmy seahorse. You need a group and time and patience to look for them. Often what's cool is they don't really change their position. They'll live on those sea fans their whole life. So if your dive master knows where they are, you can just go straight to them and see them. And you'll really just see lots of different oceanic batfish, lots of schools of various medium fish, colorful reef fish. And I don't remember many, if any, sharks. You'll see some reef sharks, but they're kind of a rarity from what I remember. It goes back to the reason why the reef is decaying, lack of sharks, is something of a concern. But still, lots of things to see and explore. And I do hope that maybe Solomon government watches this video or it brings more awareness to their reefs because you know, obviously I know it's an economical decision to fish. It makes money and people need money. But at the same time, it has to be environmentally balancing because when you try to drill in too deep and overfish in this case, it causes a big splinter and it's hard to see it on the surface. If you don't scuba dive, if you don't actually see what's down there and things that are happening, it can be very easy to just think that everything's fine. Hopefully it's only time until it gets a little bit of attention and the reefs can heal up. But with that said, I'm a big believer that tourism is actually a good thing because it brings awareness to preserving the natural environment. While normally, if you think of it just like in a capitalistic sense, you can't really make money off of environment unless it brings tourism. Trying to build a tourism industry is a way of profiting off of your beautiful environment. And if Solomon Islands became more tourist friendly and started catering to that kind of environment, maybe they can have a different income source and find ways of balancing that out. And by the way, when I say the area is overfished, I don't mean to say the locals necessarily the village people that you'll be seeing a lot who live there and live off the land and still do line and hook fishing. You'll see them all over, which is amazing. And I really recommend while you're there to go experience when the villages, you'll have maybe one or two opportunities to be able to go visit one of those villages to see how they live, see how they, their schools work, how their communities work, how they do trade with each other. And it's really quite an amazing experience. And you'll be able to observe their cultural dances and share some of their food. And it's a great experience. The commercial fishing is ruining the area of the big nets that just break everything. And you likely won't even see these operations going on because they don't happen that close to the land, but they definitely do. Like, but they're big old nets that just rake the bottom and just take everything. If you've been to Solomon Islands, what did you think? Maybe you had a better experience. Maybe my experience was just a bad experience of random luck. Let me know in the comments below. And if I piqued your interest, there is a place that has the most pristine coral I've ever seen in the world. And it's highly recommended that you check it out next. The Rainbow Reef of Fiji. And it stays true to its name of Rainbow Reef. Check it out in this video here.